Quintus Hortensius Hortilus, Consul 69 BCE. The origin of this video goes back over a decade. When I first began to read about the Roman Republic, one of the first books that I read was Anthony Everett's biography of Cicero. In that book, the figure of Hortensius features prominently. When I looked more into Hortensius, I learned that all of his works had been lost. So I kind of gave up on learning more about him. But over the years, it has always bothered me that I don't know more about the man who was supposedly Rome's second greatest orator and one of the greatest rivals to men like Cicero and Pompey. Um, so that has always rankled at me. Um, in recent years, this goes back to around 2012 or 2013 even, I've been doing quite a bit of sort of intermittent research on the great men of Rome. And now I find myself returning to the first person I really remember being curious about, Hortensius. So without any further ado or personal asides, I would like to explore the career of Hortensius from start to finish. The issues that I'd really like to highlight here are why his works have been lost and the caution that we have to take when we look at what information we do have about him. Because as I'll show, the information that we have about Hortensius is highly colored by one of his contemporaries who had a strong personal interest in presenting him a certain way. The main problem with studying Hortensius is that almost everything that we know about Hortensius's beliefs, personality, and actions comes to us from his slightly younger friend and rival Marcus Tullius Cicero. Was Hortensius's speaking style really Asiatic, or was it simply that Cicero regarded it as such because it involved more things that are Asiatic in nature than Cicero's own style? which he admits had to be subdued because he was unable to um, project his voice at a loud level for extended periods of time. How much of Hortensius's Asiatic style is simply in comparison with Cicero's own style rather than say Asiatic in a more objective sense that people other than Cicero would recognize as Asiatic. And that's just a small example that's not all that important of the kinds of potential distortion that we could experience while trying to view Hortensius, since the only way that we can view him is through the lens of Cicero, who is someone who carries many biases. Um, on the positive side, Cicero did have genuine affection and admiration for Hortensius. He wrote at one point that he deeply missed his old friend and their conversations, but Cicero, if you know anything about him, was a very self-aggrandizing man, and it is almost indisputable that any time that he wrote about someone else's beliefs, ideas, techniques, that he was doing so in a way that was unconsciously self-aggrandizing. Or at least that is the argument of an article by someone named uh, Dyke from 2008. I highly recommend that you read the article. I think the article has something like... Uh, uh, part rivals and the partners and it's about Hortensius and Cicero's friendship. Um, I think you can find it on JSTOR. It's worth a read if you're interested in this uh, topic. Um, otherwise, when we look at Hortensius's life and career, we only have passing references in Plutarch, Ovid, and Vilius Paterculus, but these are only little mentions. These are very much sort of footnote-esque references to Hortensius. All of the detailed information that we have is entirely from Cicero. So now that we have th this disclaimer out of the way, let's reconstruct Hortensius's career as best we can. Quintus Hortensius Hortilus was lucky enough to be born into the Gens Hortensia, a plebeian but noble family with roots going back a pretty long way. While the exact origins of the family are not entirely clear, we do know that someone named Quintus Hortensius rose to great prominence during the last of the secessions of the plebs in 287 when he was appointed dictator 
and then ceded the right of the people to legislate debt relief without the Senate's aid. This effectively means that one of Hortensius's ancestors empowered the tribunes to act through the people's assemblies, or at least confirmed a pre-existing right to do so. Later on, um, Hortensius, of course, would be a fairly conservative guy, so he most likely would have been a little bit uneasy with that legacy. Um, the Quintus Hortensius of the third century also holds the dubious distinction of being the only dictator to die before the expiration of his six-month term. Uh, Quintus's father Lucius was praetor in 97 and then went on to govern Sicily. As governor, he was known for exercising great probity, and even almost 30 years later, the locals of Sicily remembered him quite fondly, a fact that Cicero used to shame Hortensius when they squared off in the case of Gaius Verres in the year 70. Quintus's older brother Lucius served as a legate under Sulla in the First, first Mithridatic War and fought with great distinction. It was a fairly common practice for well-educated young men to appear in the Roman law courts and act as prosecutors against corrupt and vulnerable politicians in order to make a name for themselves. Julius Caesar did this during his early 20s in some of his first political acts. Hortensius, however, seems to hold the record for being the youngest Roman to try to do this. At the age of 19, so around the year 95 BCE or so, Hortensius appeared in courts for the first time and quickly established himself as a major player in that arena. One of his earliest cases was defending Nicomedes IV of Bithynia, a Roman client king in the east, who came to Rome seeking help because he had been usurped by his brother. It appears that Hortensius won this case and that after that victory, he was established as one of the best advocates in all of Rome, despite his extreme youth. There's also a context here that needs to be considered. At the time that Hortensius came of age, that is to say the mid to late 90s, two of the three best orators in the Roman courts died, including Mark Antony's grandfather, Marcus Antonius. This meant that only the least of the three orators who were famous during this period, Lucius Martius Philippus, was left as a potential rival. And while Philippus was a perfectly respectable orator and continued to be successful for years, he was not on the same level as Hortensius. Hortensius, like most men of his generation who would have been um, in their late teens or early 20s during this time was forced to serve during the social war of 91 to 88. While we have no direct attestation of this fact, it does appear based on the course of Hortensius's career that he shared Cicero's aversion to military service and governing provinces. He was most at home in Rome and he preferred words to actions. What was it about Hortensius which made him so effective as an advocate? It would appear, at least according to Cicero, that Hortensius was a master of the so-called Asiatic style of oratory. Um, by the way, this same style is attributed to Gaius Gracchus. The Asiatic style is characterized by complicated sentence structures that work orally but don't really read very well on paper. It also involves a lot of artificial hand gestures and body language, so very rehearsed, somewhat mechanical movements. And in the case of Hortensius, he also somehow folded his toga in a dramatic fashion to go along with what he was saying. Apparently, Hortensius was so good at what he did that dramatic actors would attend his speeches in order to improve their craft. So most of the people who would attend these orations were there for entertainment. The Roman law courts were something like daytime TV is today, except on a much higher level and with real cases and concerns. 
but for the dramatic actors who showed up to watch Hortensius, this was about learning how to better convey a sense of tragedy or drama. The best orators during this period always attracted a crowd, and it would appear that Hortensius was a fan favorite. So if people heard that there was going to be a trial, they might ask which lawyers were going to be there, and if the name Hortensius was mentioned, then you could expect a pretty sizable crowd. People like Hortensius and Cicero really thrived on the idea that everyone was listening to their words. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, there are no surviving examples of Hortensius' speeches, and in fact it appears that his speeches did not last long. Whereas many texts of antiquity were lost during the Middle Ages, it appears that Hortensius' text didn't even come close to making it out of antiquity. The last known reader who claimed to have touched Hortensius' speeches and evaluated them was Quintilian in the first century CE. So only after a century, Hortensius' speeches had already faded into obscurity. If Cicero was right and Hortensius used um, sentences that read well orally but didn't work on paper, then that would explain quite a bit um, since people largely evaluate their reading choices by how pleasant something is to read. And if Hortensius reads horribly, then that would largely explain why his orations haven't stood the test of time and were lost so long ago. Following his military service in the Social War, Hortensius was fast approaching an age, he had been born back in 114, when he could expect to hold his first magistracies and really proceed with his career. However, the 80s proved to be a not very productive time for Hortensius when it came to advancing his career. In 88, Sulla had gone east to fight Mithridates and his rival Senna had established himself and his faction in power at Rome. Most people remember Marius coming back, but really the power in Rome was Senna, Marius' ally. Senna allowed his allies to hold repeat magistracies to build up their clout, and this meant that the men who were not in Senna's circle, such as Hortensius, didn't advance. So there simply wasn't space for Hortensius since Senna was filling the Senate with people who were loyal to him. Hortensius's journey through the Curse of Norum, therefore, seems to have taken a hit from Senna's policy of repeat magistracies. If we had to guess based on his age at the time when he held different offices, it appears that Hortensius fell about two years behind the um, schedule for the Curse of Norum. For instance, when he held the consulship in 69, that was actually two years after his minimum eligibility would have occurred in 71, and we see that this is also true for when he held the office of Edile and all of the others. It also seems that during this time of Senna's domination in Rome, that Hortensius was bested once by his rival um, Marcius Philippus when he was arguing against Pompey receiving his father's estate. The reason that we know Philippus must have won is because Pompey was accepted as Pompey as Strabo's heir and was able to use his position as Strabo's heir to raise an army and support Sulla when he eventually returned to Italy. For Hortensius, just like many of the other young, ambitious conservatives in Rome, Sulla's dictatorship was a great time. This was a period during which men like Hortensius tended to thrive. It was actually under Sulla when Hortensius would achieve his greatest courtroom victories. During this period, there were many corrupt governors coming home to Rome, and they were mostly guilty and looking for a good defense lawyer to prevent them from being prosecuted. By and large, Sulla was willing to overlook corruption at almost every turn, and he was really only concerned with protecting the prerogatives of the Senate and preventing uh, anyone from following in his footsteps and marching on Rome. 
Hortensius, just like all of the advocates in Rome, was not allowed to collect a direct fee for his services. However, it was understood that clients who were grateful could give gifts to the people who'd help them achieve acquittal. And since many of these corrupt governors had been robbing the provinces blind, they were able to reward their advocates quite handsomely. So during this period, Hortensius effectively defended corrupt and obviously guilty governors. Supposedly, according to Cicero, uh, Hortensius did this through a combination of very clever rhetoric and reasoning and some well-placed bribes here and there. After all, it was worth his time to bribe the jurors if uh, you know, he knew that he was going to get a bigger payday down the road from this governor who had a large um, sum of money that he had collected illegally from the provinces. In the year 81, Hortensius finally entered the Senate when he achieved the lowest ranking office of Keister. This meant that he was now a senator and just like many of his contemporaries, his career began under Sulla. For Hortensius, the period of his greatest success had to be the 70s. During that decade, he was the clear and undisputed king of the Roman law courts. This is also the time when he climbed the ladder of the Cursus Honorum and began to approach its pinnacle, the consulship. He served as Edile in the year 75, and he threw games that were memorable and which helped to boost his popularity. In 72, he served as Praetor and finally most likely got to preside over the courts that he had um, attended and participated in for over two decades by that point. In the year 70, something happened that fundamentally changed Hortensius's career. He was scheduled to defend the corrupt governor of Sicily, Gaius Verres, and this was a pretty routine humdrum task for someone who had made a career out of doing just that. Varies was most likely no more guilty than some of the other people Hortensius had defended in the past. And Hortensius' own father had been governor of Sicily back in the 90s, and he had been very popular and uh, upstanding. So the fact that his son would now defend the conduct of Varies would give Varies a certain amount of credibility. Hortensius had every reason to expect that this trial would be yet another success for him. His opponent was the young and scrappy Marcus Tullius Cicero, and while Hortensius had probably heard him speak and had some respect for his ability, he was quite confident in his ability to handle this upstart. However, um, in the event Cicero had gone to Sicily and poured in the hard work necessary to assemble an absolutely overwhelming case, he produced evidence of almost every item that was stolen. He uh, furnished witnesses um, galore. And ultimately, it was a steamroll. Hortensius was not only beaten, but he was beaten totally. Varys not only got convicted, but he was exiled, and he would spend the rest of his life down to about the year 43 in exile in what is now southern France. This major victory on Cicero's behalf established him as the new king of the law courts, and for a while Hortensius will try his best to contest Cicero for that spot at the top, Despite losing his throne in the law courts, Hortensius' career was still going very well. In 69, he was consul, and during that year, he didn't really have a very eventful consulship. There was an opportunity to achieve glory and to make up for the loss that he had just suffered to Cicero in the courts, and that was to take up the command against pirates on Crete. The piracy problem had gotten out of control, and uh, Hortensius was the first choice to hold that command. However, he wasn't interested. So instead, that command went to his colleague Quintus Caecilius Metellus, 
and it turns out that this was a great opportunity to achieve an easy victory because Metellus was able to add the cognomen Creticus to his name for his efforts. So Hortensius effectively passed up on a chance to win some military glory in a campaign that wasn't going to be very difficult. Not a smart decision, but most likely his reason for wanting to remain behind is to continue to hone his craft in the law courts and really try to rival Cicero. Hortensius was still active in the courts and a major player, but at this point everyone except his closest friends would have recognized that Cicero was indeed the greatest of the Roman orators. They would clash during the mid-60s over some political matters. Hortensius defended his good friend Lucius Lucullus's command against Mithridates, while Cicero argued successfully in favor of giving that command to Pompey, who was fresh off of some other victories. Hortensius during this period was already a staunch conservative. This appears to be the political um, sort of orientation that he had throughout his entire life, whereas Cicero during this period self-identified as a moderate, neither an optimate nor a popularis. And because of that, they would clash at times, but they were never seriously at odds with one another, and there's no reason to think that they ever hated each other or held any real bitterness. Famously, Following his unjust removal from command against Mithridates, Lucius Licinius Lucullus decided to retreat into a private life of pleasure and largely left politics altogether. He was one of the closest friends of Hortensius, and along with a third friend, Lucius Cornelius Sassena, the three aristocrats engaged in quite a few pleasures and luxuries. They had quite a bit of otium or leisure, and they used it to full effect. All three of them were quite dedicated to pleasure, although it must also be said that all three of them were also very energetic and hardworking when they needed to be. Hortensius had made quite a fortune from his orations, and he had received many gifts, so he was able to engage in buying great villas, building parks, supplying fish ponds. Romans would literally um, have fishermen catch a bunch of fish from the sea and then transport them to their private fish ponds inland. That was quite expensive, as you might imagine. He bought the finest wines, Falernian and, or Falernian and others. He collected art, and he also put on costly entertainments for his friends. While Hortensius was not quite as well known as a gourmand as, as his friend Lucullus, he was reputedly the first Roman to introduce peacocks as a delicacy, something that would become a feature of Roman banquets and that I believe appears in Petronic, uh, Petronius's Satyricon in the following century. Um, with his friends Lucullus and Sicena, it appears that Hortensius struck a deal that each of them would write a history. We don't know exactly what Sicena was responsible for writing, but it appears that Lucullus completed a history in Greek on the social war. Hortensius's task, which he also completed, was to produce a Latin history of the social war. We don't have any fragments of the work, but we do know from Velius Paterculus that Hortensius's work on the um, social war was quite well regarded and that historians of antiquity read it with great attention. If you have the mixed pleasure of reading Cicero's letters to Atticus and his other friends, you know that he was deeply insecure, especially about his status as a Noah's homo. He wanted nothing more than to be accepted by the noble born among the Roman elite. He wanted to be admired and respected by men such as Cato the Younger and Hortensius. But for most of his life, up to 63 at least, Cicero was viewed as an outsider and an upstart. While we might view the Roman elite from the outside as being a fairly cohesive and small whole, we have to remember that for them, the small differences in pedigree 
made a huge difference socially, and that a lot of these guys weren't really associating with Cicero outside of the Senate if they didn't have to because they viewed him as being beneath them. He, of course, didn't have any ancestors who had ever held any offices. However, that changed dramatically in 63. As consul, Cicero proved himself to be an upholder of the Senate's prerogatives when he defeated um, the Catalinarian conspiracy. He did so competently, and the Senate was quite grateful. They declared him father of the fatherland, they paraded him around the streets in sort of an unofficial mock triumph, and this was a big moment in Cicero's career. Most likely the person who sort of opened up these social circles for Cicero was Hortensius. Um, it appears that Hortensius had been genuinely won over by Cicero in terms of really respecting his intellect and his abilities, and he would most likely have been the gateway into this world, the social circle. And if we think about how Cicero remembers Hortensius so fondly, talks about how he was never bitter, and really just talks about how much he misses him, it kind of uh, seems pretty likely that um, Hortensius was that gateway to this inner circle of Rome's most elite people. It also occurs that after 63, now that Cicero is socially accepted by the conservatives in Rome, that he himself becomes more conservative in his politics. I guess that's also aggravated quite a bit by the formation of the first triumvirate and Cicero's exclusion from that group. Um, not to mention his uh, troubles with Clodius, who was a creature of the first triumvirate. But anyway, um, what happens is not only do Cicero and Hortensius become good friends, but they also become political allies who are now on the same side pretty much every time they appear in court. They defend and prosecute the same people during the 60s and into the 50s. Both of them were counselors for Gaius Rabirius, Lucius Licinius Murena, Publius Cornelius Sola, the nephew of the dictator Sola, and Titus Aeneas Milo, the great rival of Clodius. One can imagine that Cicero was quite eager for that trial, and uh, Hortensius most likely was too, as he was a elitist guy who did not like people who led street gangs. So in order to combat the street gang of Clodius, Hortensius decided, like most of his contemporaries, that backing the street gang of Milo was a sound idea. While Hortensius remained politically active and continued to express his opinions when he was called upon, for the most part he was so disgusted by the first triumvirate and especially by the rise of Pompey and the really cementing of his power that he just decided to focus most of his attention on the law courts instead of the political arena in the stricter sense of the word. During the 50s and the early part of the decade, however, Hortensius became one of the many men who developed a big man crush on Cato the Younger. Cato was the most outspoken and charismatic of the Optimates, despite being quite a bit younger and less distinguished than many of his colleagues, such as Hortensius and Bibulus. When a man crush is largely one-sided, it can lead to some awkward and bizarre outcomes. One such man crush was Cicero's love for Pompey, which was in no way reciprocated. But a much more interesting man crush is the one that Hortensius had on Cato. It got to the point where Hortensius begged Cato to become his father-in-law because he wanted to be um, bound by marriage to Cato and his family because he so admired Cato and his politics. So his plan was to marry Cato's daughter, who was 20 years old, named Portia Catanus. However, Portia was already married to Bibulus, another older man, and they already had two children together. So Cato didn't think that it would be appropriate. Plus, as I've mentioned in the past, Bibulus, despite the nature of his consulship, 
was still very well regarded among the Optimates, and to alienate him in such a way would not be all that wise if you're trying to keep this coalition together and actively opposing the Triumvirs. So instead, Cato got pretty creative. Instead of giving Hortensius his daughter, he instead spoke with his father-in-law and secured a divorce from his own wife, Marcia, and then had Marcia marry Hortensius. So this was an odd arrangement to say the least. The kinship between Cato and Hortensius was by no means official, but in many ways what ended up happening is that they did a kind of one-sided wife swap. I suppose Hortensius thought that by having sex with the same woman that Cato had once had sex with that they were closer now. The whole thing is weird. Uh, perhaps Cato was looking for another wife at the time, and this was a convenient way to get to that objective. I don't know. But at any rate, like I said, man crushes can lead to some weird places, and this is one of the weirder uh, personal relationships that I have encountered, at least in terms of uh, Roman Republic. This marriage would have some implications, however, and the end result would be a scandal. And I also get the impression, although I can't quite prove it, that Hortensius's actions seem to his own children to be the actions of a senile old man, and that this led to a major rift with his adult son, Quintus Hortensius. And the reason I think that is because despite the conservatism of Hortensius, his son Quintus would side with Julius Caesar during the Civil War. It wasn't unprecedented for people to side with a different faction than the ones that their fathers had belonged to, but it was hardly the norm. And if he felt like he was going to be disinherited in favor of another child just because his dad was a huge fan of Cato, then I can imagine that being enough to turn a young Quintus Hortensius against his father and his father's politics. But again, that is somewhat speculative. While Hortensius' glory days of the 70s were long behind him, and while his recent marriage to Marcia might make it seem like he was going through some kind of severe midlife or late life crisis, perhaps even beginning to slip into senility, it turns out that Hortensius was still pretty sharp at age 64 and that he would be able to go out with style. He would be able to go out in the way that he became famous. In 50, during his last known case, Hortensius successfully defended Appius Claudius Polker of charges of treason and corruption. The prosecutor was none other than Cicero's protege and future son-in-law, Publius Cornelius de Labola. So this must have been something of a point of pride for Hortensius that he was able to beat someone who was a student of his greatest rival. Now, while that is not quite as satisfying as beating the master himself, it's still something. And when we consider that Hortensius was clearly past his prime and that this was his last act, it becomes a little more meaningful. I would compare it to Kobe Bryant dropping 60 points. Sure, it was a meaningless end of the season game, uh, with both teams not being playoff contenders, but still, he dropped 60, and the guy was known as a scorer. So, that's pretty cool. Same thing here. Hortensius won a case, maybe wasn't the most important case of his life, but he did it against an opponent who was worthy, and he did it in a manner reminiscent of what had made him famous in the first place. So, it's a fitting end. Later that year, Hortensius died of natural causes, and Cicero's social life became a little bit poorer. To circle back to Hortensius's marriage to Marcia, this would end up having some important consequences for all of the people involved. Marcia was able to bear the aging Hortensius another heir, and it was this new child who inherited the entire estate in the year 50. Marcia quickly moved to remarry and ended up remarrying Cato. This meant that effectively Cato was the heir to Hortensius's fortune. 
so all of the fish ponds and pleasure palaces that Hortensius had used his um, court fees to build ended up going to Cato the Younger, supposedly a man of great probity and morality who cared nothing for money. Now, it's unlikely that Marcia and Cato exactly planned this, but again, when people talk about just how upstanding and moral Cato was, there are a few things in his record which can call that into question, and this is the biggest red flag of them all. It also is quite possible that Cato and his wife refused to turn over some of Hortensius's property to his other heirs. His son Quintus Hortensius, as I mentioned earlier, had been a friend of the poet Catullus, and he was probably driven in the Caesar's arms by the inheritance issue. Um, it, it's not entirely clear why he became a Caesarian, but this is one of the most likely causes, and it's the only thing that really stands out as being a kind of uh, catalyst for such a move. Caesar trusted the younger Hortensius enough that he appointed him governor of Macedonia in 44. Um, however, right after he assumed office, the younger Hortensius was faced with a crisis because his patron Caesar was assassinated. Um, during the ensuing civil wars, he decided to switch back to the side of the Senate by embracing the cause of Brutus and ended up being killed in action at the Battle of Philippi in 42. Hortensius' daughter Hortensia was also someone who had a lot of character and was known for her public speaking abilities. There were very few women who had excellent public speaking abilities, so this made her stand out quite a bit. In the year 42, as the warring factions in Rome were trying to raise money to continue making war, there was a proposal to make a special tax on wealthy matrons. Hortensia showed up to try to shoot down this proposal as she was one of the women who would be affected by it. And while she was not able to defeat the measure in its entirety, she was able to get it scaled back and partially remitted. So she became a household name and hero for the wealthy women of Rome. Hortensius, like Cicero, had a broad range of interest, and those interests included philosophy, just like all of the educated elites of that period. However, since Hortensius' writings have all been lost, and since no one other than Cicero was all that interested in Hortensius' opinions on philosophy, we don't know a lot about what Hortensius thought about philosophy. So we have to rely, once again, on Cicero's accounting. Cicero wrote a dialogue called the Hortensius, which features Hortensius prominently as one of the speakers. The setting is completely fictional, however, as it takes place on Lucullus's villa sometime in the 60s before the Catalinarian conspiracy and features a meeting between Hortensius, Cicero, Lucullus, and Catullus. The reasons that I know that this is merely an acceptance fantasy on the part of Cicero and not a conversation that actually took place is because Lucullus was fresh off of losing his command to Pompey and one of the chief architects of the transfer of command was Cicero. So there's no way that Lucullus would invite Cicero to come hang out with him. It just doesn't really pass muster. This is mostly an acceptance fantasy on Cicero's part, where he is sort of rewriting his own past to, you know, make it seem like he had always been popular and well-liked. But anyway, let's move past the setting and Cicero's sort of psychological motivation and just talk about the ideas present. In this dialogue, all four men speak and express their own ideas. They are discussing the best use of odium or leisure. The question was, how should one best use one's spare time? What is the most profitable or productive way that one can spend that time? And not only do they all agree that this should be spent in study, but then they go on to discuss what is the best and most profitable field of study. 
Hortensius early on stakes out a position that oratory is the most useful art form. Um, Lucullus and Catullus say some stuff too, but nothing all that interesting. And after someone else had defended philosophy, Hortensius was attacking philosophy's utility. Up to that point, Cicero, who had been respecting men who had held more offices than he had, had held silent, but once philosophy was attacked, he had to step in and defend philosophy's honor against Hortensius. Cicero, who wrote the dialogue, prevails. Um, it's, this is part of the reason why Dyke and some others suspect that any time that Cicero wrote about Hortensius and his other friends that he was being self-aggrandizing because he named that dialogue the Hortensius but ultimately made himself the hero. So again, uh, Hortensius might come off looking okay in this, but the person who really is the hero is clearly Cicero. Um, Cicero also wrote a treatise on rhetoric called the Brutus, dedicated to Brutus. However, there is also a dedication of the work to the memory of Hortensius, with Cicero claiming that Hortensius was a wonderful friend who often offered him constructive criticism and was never jealous or bitter despite their rivalry and Cicero getting the better of him. Once again, we see uh, Cicero trying to really just uh, portray that relationship as one where, or the rivalry, I mean, as a one-sided series of ass whoopings when we don't really know if that was the case. For instance, we know Hortensius was better than Philippus, but Philippus still got him at least once. Most likely, Hortensius won a case or two against Cicero at some point. Anyway, let's not get too far off track. Um, effectively, what Cicero does with Hortensius is that he portrays him as a kind of Roman sophist. The sophist in ancient Greece, one of whom Protagoras is pictured on the screen, really argued that um, perception is reality to some extent, and their sort of version of reality is that it was subjective. Protagoras effectively said that man is the measure of all things. They tried to argue against subjective reality and instead argue for a more subjective interpretation of reality. The sophists are in many ways much more in step with modern thinking than most of the more prominent ancient schools of thought. However, in the eyes of the ancients, at least the people who really controlled things, the so-called philosophers like Plato were in a completely different category and completely morally superior to people like Protagoras um, because they defended uh, this like objective order of reality and did not try to put man on a pedestal of the gods. So Cicero really is doing some heavy virtue signaling in this work, but it is not entirely improbable that someone like Hortensius, who of course is most famous for just defending obviously guilty clients, would really, you know, espouse this view. I could easily imagine Hortensius being a moral relativist who thinks that the stronger argument should prevail regardless of the sort of objective merits of that argument. After all, that would be an easy way to justify his entire life. So again, we don't know for sure if Hortensius would have agreed with what Cicero wrote, but it's likely that Cicero thought that he was being fair to the memory of his old friend and that there would be other people who would have talked to Hortensius and who would have called bullshit if Cicero had gone too far uh, away from reality. That, that was a long and rambling section, but I'm not editing it and I'm not... I'm not changing it in any way. You just have to sit through it and grin and bear it. So what is the significance of Hortensius if all of his works have been lost and he has been relegated to obscurity as just a sort of irrelevant rival of Cicero? Well, he's still fairly significant, in fact. His range of intellectual interest and literary output closely mirrors that of Cicero and what this shows is that Cicero was not truly unique. A lot of people who study classics are very much bound up in truth and beauty, and they really like to talk about the uniqueness and the specialness of the people and works that they most admire. 
You can't really argue that Cicero is unique if you know about Hortensius, however. Hortensius may have been less successful than Cicero, especially in terms of being remembered, but his career shows that you could make it in Rome as an orator first and foremost, and that these orators often had a broad range of interest which went beyond just speaking in the Senate and the law courts. So Cicero was not an anomaly. He was someone who was very much a possibility and a likelihood in a system like that of the late Republic. Hortensius was also a major player during the last few decades of the Republic before the outbreak of Caesar's Civil War. As I mentioned in my video on Bibulus, it is a mistake to think that just because Cato the Younger is the most prominent name now when we think back to the Optimates, that he was the real power behind that group. You have to remember the importance of rank and office holding in terms of determining seniority. Hortensius, as an excellent speaker and a former consul, would have gotten to speak a long time before Cato in Senate debates. Cato never held the consulship. So Hortensius's influence was potentially greater than Cato's on a number of occasions. Hortensius, as an educated uh, man who was a politician and an intellectual, was no doubt an interesting thinker. If Cicero's right, then he was kind of a latter-day sophist. He came between the sophist of 5th century Athens and the sophist who emerged in the so-called against sophistic during the imperial period. So he might have been a man on an island in a sense, or maybe there was a larger sort of um, quasi-sophistic movement at this time of which Hortensius is a representative. I wish we knew more. Um, even after learning all that I've learned about Hortensius, I find myself really feeling like I want to know a lot more, and I'm sad that I probably won't ever be able to learn more about him due to our source limitations. A another thing that Hortensius reveals that I find rather depressing is that his whole career demonstrates quite clearly that even a politically significant figure whose work was well regarded can become obscure quickly and be mostly forgotten over time. If this happened to Hortensius, uh, this could very well happen to a whole lot of highly important people in the modern world if we were able to ever to have something like a massive uh, breakdown of our digital databases, for instance. Um, so that's just something that I think is a sobering thought because Hortensius, like I mentioned, was not one of the sources who was lost during the Middle Ages, but instead was more or less just simply discarded during the height of antiquity. Anyhow, those are my thoughts on Quintus Hortensius Hortilus. And once again, this is in many ways the guy who inspired me in the long run to start doing the kind of work that I've been doing during this series. So if you enjoy this series, don't thank me, thank Hortensius.